Facebook. What's going on, on Facebook? To tell the truth each day. Hey, we're going to get started here in a few minutes. I want to give everybody a chance to go and get people inviting share. I want to give you a chance to do that. So you definitely want to go invite and share. Listen, man, I'm only going to be on here for 40 minutes tonight, man. 40 minutes. I know some people came on here last night and they was looking and wondering, you know, hey, how you doing, Precious? So I know people was thinking, hey, what's going on? Hello, one of my daughters on here. So listen, I know people was thinking like, man, what's going on? What's happening? What's going on? So we're going to speak the truth tonight, man. Go and tag somebody in this. Go like, go share on your page. We'll be right back in a minute. I'm gonna give, I'm gonna give y'all about five minutes to get on here, and then we're gonna get started. All right. Hello, there go my other daughter. Hello, Vanessa. How you doing, precious? y'all right, how y'all doing i'm back let's go ahead and get this thing started so we just thank you papa for what you're about to do in this atmosphere and in this place ask that you would lead and direct to god every single word that we say actually we magnified and lifted up in the mighty name of jesus we thank you for how you're going to move god how you're going to speak through me on today to give wisdom insight and advice to these your people and God, we declare and decree, God, that wisdom, revelation, knowledge will flow right now, Papa. We just welcome you to this atmosphere and into this moment. In Jesus' precious name, we do pray. Amen and amen. Well, I'm here. I'm glad you're there. I'm here. We're here. Let's get ready to do this. Um, so, I was trying to look this up uh Somebody put in the comments just that. And when people, when you're putting in comments, I'm, I'm actually reading them. Some of the comments I may not be able to respond to until the next broadcast. And so that's just kind of what we're going to do it. Um, so some stuff I won't be able to actually talk about until the next broadcast that we actually have. And so somebody put a question up there yesterday uh, in regards to holiness. Um, they were saying... Um, let me read it off. It says, without holiness, you cannot see the kingdom. Uh, that actually is not true. Um, that is not biblical. I was trying to look up um, the scripture. I couldn't find it. Now, I know the scripture they're talking. They're referencing to the scripture in Hebrews. Let me scoot over in the middle of this. They're referencing to the scripture in Hebrews that says, uh, without holiness, no man can see the Lord. Um, that particular... That specific scripture uh, was not talking in regards to uh, the kingdom. Um, I know a lot of people make that interchangeable, but that's not that's not what we're doing. So we're gonna speak truth tonight, man. I'm gonna speak life into you know a lot of you all tonight. Thank God for everybody who's tuning in. Please go share, go share. You want to share tonight? Uh, we're gonna speak wisdom. So I'm gonna pick back up from last night where I left off last night. We were talking about some stuff last night. Want to kind of unpack this a little bit more um, as it pertains to uh, some of the things that we were sharing uh, about the kingdom and kingdom language. 
So I'm actually going to talk tonight about the cult, the kingdom. Well, not really the kingdom culture. I'm talking about the church community uh, tonight. And so uh, this is going to be really impactful for you all. I was going to write that down. I'm not going to have time to do that. So we're going to put that over there. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. All right. So um, go to Acts. Well, hold on. Let me let me do my reviews real quick because I had a couple things. Also, somebody somebody brought this up to me today, which was my I mean, my cousin talked to me about this today. If you all have been following me on my Saturday teachings, you will know that in my on my Saturday teachings with my church um, that I've been talking about prayer. Let me say this. There are a lot of people who are praying and have prayed in our prayer, quote unquote, prayer warriors or intercessors. Listen to me. Listen, Linda, listen. OK, if you have not listened to any of the teachings I have given on prayer and you love to pray or you are a person who does pray a lot for people and for yourself, you are doing yourself an injustice if you have not heard my teachings. And I'm not saying it just because I'm teaching. I'm saying it because the substance in the teaching will revolutionize the way you think about prayer. Completely. Everything that God showed me is biblical. I'm not giving you something, my own predilection. I'm not giving you my assumption. I'm not giving you something that, that I, I per se think or thought. I'm giving you biblical principles of how to actually pray. Um, I was telling my, uh, I was telling my, uh, somebody this, I told them that the, the, the crazy part is, is that when, hello, Apostle Pebbles. The crazy part is when it comes, uh, when we start talking about prayer, a lot of people do not know how to get consistent breakthrough. And a lot of people cannot tell you consistently how to actually have a successful prayer life. And the crazy part is if we're not consistent in breakthrough, how can we actually lead people through prayer? You know, and for those of you who do intercession, you need to go listen to my teaching. I keep, I don't understand how things and resources can be available to people and people don't make time to actually dive into those resources when you work in that field, when it's something that you love to do. And I, of course, I'm not the only one that has taught about prayer, but I do believe that after what God has showed me in scripture about what prayer is, and if you're somebody who does it, you are doing yourself a grave injustice not to listen to all of the teachings in their entirety, in their entirety from A to Z. I strongly encourage you to go listen to it. And it may be teaching that you may have to break down and go back and listen to it another time. That's cool, but definitely go and listen to them. So I bring that up because my, uh, uh, it was mentioned to me about prayer versus spending time with God. So let me make this clear. I'm going to say this and I'm going to move on. I'm just doing a quick review and then I'm going to get into today's uh, teaching. Okay. So um, prayer is different than spending time with God. We haven't been taught that. I wasn't taught that uh, being raised in God and being raised in church. Hello, uh, Naya, uh, uh, um, Nia, um, I was not taught that being raised in church, that prayer is actually different than spending time with God, but spending time with God and praying is two distinctly, distinctively different things. When you pray, you are in a, you are handling a judicial process. Prayer is God's judicial process and judicial proceeding of how to enter into and how to get benefits and the blessings, the spiritual blessings he has for us to receive. That is what prayer is. Supplication is another process of the judicial um, proceedings of how to get answers um, according to the will of God and according to the will of Jesus that he gave us. Hear me clearly. Prayer is not necessarily Spending time with God. It is indirectly spending time with God, but prayer is not directly spending time with God. That's not what I discovered in scripture. Okay, so let me throw a little label on this and then I'm going to move on. I know I'm saying something heavy here. I'm not going to say it. Everything needs to be said on this because I did four teachings on this. You just need to go listen to the teachings um, in their entirety. Don't listen 30 minutes and then say you understand it. You literally need to listen from A to Z. Okay. Um, let me say this. So every time you look in scripture and it says, uh, it, we're talking about spending time with God. Um, every time we um, see spending time with God in scripture, 
we're seeing the word seek, S-E-E-K, seek. They that diligently seek shall be rewarded. Then Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom. It's always told us to seek. The Bible says, rise early and seek. You know, it's, it's telling you to actually spend that time with the Father. So spending time with the Father is not praying. I need to be clear about this. Spending time with the Father is not prayer directly. Though, though it can be perceived to be a form of prayer, it is not prayer directly. Again, I won't go off into that. Go and listen to the teachings. You'll understand what I'm saying better as you begin to understand the teachings. Lastly, um, I was talking about kingdom language yesterday, and, and we're going to kind of go right back into that today. I got about 30 minutes with y'all today. I'm going in 30 minutes. So uh, right now, if you're on here and you have not went to your page and you have not shared this broadcast, you are doing your friends on your page an injustice because I'm going to share and unpack stuff today um, as it pertains to the kingdom of God, as it pertains to the church community, that if you are a confessing believer, you need to know. One of the things I brought up yesterday in understanding a kingdom language is this. The average Christian cannot break down for you the, the, the distinction between the kingdom and between the church. They don't even know. A lot of people cannot even tell you what is church and what is kingdom. That's a huge issue because if we don't know what church is, if we don't know where church ends and kingdom begins, then we cannot be uh, clear and concise in our interpretation of what kingdom is or what church is. And so what I'm doing this week and probably the rest of this month, I'm going to have me some guests on here that's going to help me unpack some stuff, okay? I do got guests I'm, I'm going to have on here with me unpacking things, all right? And I'm excited about the guests that we're going to have. If you don't understand this, this breakdown of church and kingdom, it's going to be really hard for you to understand the real message Jesus preached. Many people, when you ask them, many people, when you ask them, hello, Miss Moore, it's been a long time. How you doing, ma'am? So let me tell you this, it's, it's, if you don't understand this breakdown, I'm telling you right now, if you don't understand the breakdown between kingdom and between church, you're not really going to understand the message that Jesus preached. Many people, when you ask them, what was the message Jesus preached? They will tell you salvation. They will tell you the cross. They will tell you healing. Some folks will say he talked about demons. And I'm here to tell you, ma'am, sir, if you don't know that Jesus came to teach the message of the kingdom and you don't understand what that means you do not know what the kingdom is and you do not know the real message of what jesus preached okay it's really clear and i can show you scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture that the bible says jesus went about teaching the kingdom not teaching church not teaching salvation Though we should and we must teach salvation to understand kingdom, we must teach church in order to understand kingdom. That was not; Those were not the primary messages of Jesus. When the Bible says he resurrected from the grave and he spent 40 days going throughout teaching men of God for 40 days, he taught over 500, pe um, uh, 500 people, not salvation. He taught them the message of the kingdom. Now, I know what I'm saying is heavy because we're not taught this in church, right? We're taught that we need to get people saved. And we should. But what happens after salvation? The average person, hello, Tevin, the average person who attends church on a regular basis is just coming and checking the block. They come in to say they've been in attendance at church and that's it. What happens to the believer after salvation? If we do not push people beyond the cross into the, into the narrow road and narrow gate leading into the kingdom, we are doing people a disservice. Anyway, I'm speaking truth. That's what this is about. Speak truth. So we're going to talk about real topics and real discussions and dialogues. Now, I've said all that to say, let's get into today's teaching. Today, I'm going to teach you about what one aspect 
of what the church community should look like and the embodiment of that. I brought up a statement yesterday. I would need to back it up in scripture. It was a very heavy statement, though you do not realize it. And I and the statement was, the statement was, okay, God supplying all our needs. And here is the question. Is it up to God to supply the needs of the saints? That's the question. Is it specifically up to God to supply the needs of the saints? Here is something else. Why does God give the saints provision? Why does God give us an abundance of blessings? These are things that I want to talk about. And I know people are probably going to log off and go do other things right now because some people are not going to be really used to this right here because we 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 tie this into prosperity teaching. And I, I'm really I'm really not talking anything about prosperity today. Today, I'm going to give you strictly Bible about how we should handle the church community. All right. So go to the book of Acts. Go to the book of Acts. And um, Acts, the fourth chapter. Verse 31. So yesterday we talked about language. Today I'm going to talk about how the church community should coexist. Here we go. Um, now, and I'm going to show you scriptures. All right, here we go. So Acts 4 and 31. I'm going to move expeditiously through these scriptures. Say what I got to say and I'm going. Acts, the fourth chapter, verse 31. Look at this. And they prayed. The place where they were meeting was shaken. And all were filled with. With the Holy Spirit and 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 spoke the word of God boldly. I'm reading all the way down to verse 35. Look at verse 32. All the believers were were in were in one heart and mind, and no one claimed that any of their possessions were their own, but they shared everything. But they shared. Excuse me. Just realize that. But they shared, it says, but they shared everything. Okay? But they shared, it says, but they shared everything. You hear what I'm saying? They shared everything. Then it says, it shared, they shared everything that they had. Verse 33. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of of the Lord Jesus and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all watch this the grace was so powerfully in them all that there were no needy persons among them so a part of grace is so that every need will be met isn't that interesting look at this um, uh, for, for watch this um, there was no needy persons among them for from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, uh, brought the money from the, um, brought the money from the sales, verse 35, and put it at the, at the apostles feet. And it was distributed. The monies from the sales was distributed to everyone who had need. Wow. So it's not up to God. To take care of the needs of the church. <laughs> it's up to the people of the church. To take care of the needs of the people in the church. Interesting. Interesting. Really interesting. Go to chapter 2. Go to Acts 2. Acts the second chapter. I just want to show you Bible man. I'm not going to give you my perception. I'm going to give you what the word of God says about this. Acts the second chapter, verses 44 through 47. Acts the second chapter, verses 44 through 47. Look at this. All the believers were together and had everything in common. I'm reading out the NIV, verse 45. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. So they sold stuff. They took the money and gave to people who were in need. Interesting. Verse 46. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Verse 47. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I wonder why folks went and joined church. 
Probably because the church acted like the church. So it's not up. I just showed you some passages of scripture that showed you it's not up to God to take care of the needs of the saints. It's up to the job of the saints to take care of the needs of the saints. We're gonna get to it. We're gonna get to it because I'm not we're gonna we gonna unpack this. So now here is a scripture I want to go to now. I'm gonna skip to this. And then we're gonna go into the book. I'm gonna go into the book. <sighs> I only got about 20 minutes, y'all. I'm finna unpack something tonight that's going to literally revolutionize the way that you perceive um, faith and works. I'm going to unpack something tonight. I've taught on this before, but I'm going to teach on it again because it's right in what I want to talk about. All right. So go to the book of Philippians. Philippians 4 and 19. Philippians, the fourth chapter, the 19th verse. Look at this. Please go share this with other people. Please go share, like, and share. And y'all more than welcome to leave comments too. I don't see a lot of people leaving comments because I, I guess y'all just waiting on me to say something else powerful. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, y'all can definitely, um, you know, do that if y'all want to. All right. So Philippians 4, 19 says this. And my God will meet, it says, and my God, it says, and my God, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. So yes, God does meet needs according to his riches and glory, but that, that's not to oversight what the church is obligated to do. Listen to me, y'all. I'm going to tip my glass a little bit. We are obligated to take care of the needs of the church. It's not a question. It's an obligation. I'm going to show you that tonight in scripture. I'm going to show you tonight. All right. So now I'm kind of building this up. And uh, let's go to the book of James. Let's go to I'm trying I'm trying to teeter totter around the book of James. Actually, you know what? Let's go to 1 John. 1 John. Because I probably need to walk that out a little bit before I did that. Because the book of James is really where the nuts and bolts is going to be. So go to 1 John 3. 1 John, the third chapter. And verse 15. 1 John 3 and 15. Look at this. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer and you do not know and you know not that no mur and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. Verse 16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Look at this. Now, here's how you lay down your life. Look at this. If anyone has listen to this. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? So how do I lay down my life? I lay down my life by being able to meet a physical, tangible need. All right. Verse 18. Dear children, let us not love in word or speech. But with actions and in truth, verse 19, this is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. So how I'm able to go into the presence of God and be at peace and be at rest is knowing that God can use me and move on me to meet the needs of my other brothers and sisters in Christ. Not sitting there saying God will supply your needs. When I have it in my capacity to meet their needs. And I love what it says right here. It says right here, look at verse, look at verse, uh, look at verse uh, 17. It says, if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Lord Jesus, I know it's a major conviction right now. 
How can the love of God be in you when you know you got it in your? And I'm telling you, listen to me. Now, what I'm going to say next is, pro, is prophetic. I mean, it's prophetic. There is coming a time in the world where you are going to have to give your possessions to your brother and your brother and sister give possessions to you because the church is going to go underground. And we're going to need each other in those moments. I know I'm knocking the prosperity gospel all in the head right now. I get it. I get it. But that's what God called me to do, right? So, let me show you this. Let's go to the book of Matthew, Mark. Go to the book of Mark. And then I'm going to get into James last. Go into the book of Mark. Mark. Was it in John? Was it in John? Matter of fact, go to the book of John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John, the sixth chapter. John 6, verses 5 through 7. John 6, verses 5 through 7. John 6, verses 5 through 7. Look at this. John, the sixth chapter, verses 5 through 7. Look at this. Verse 5. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Now look what Philip said. He asked this only to test him. For he already had in mind what he was going to do. All right. Now go to Mark. So now Jesus and I'm going to give you the same story. Now this, now this particular miracle was done in, in, in all, I mean, it was really written down in all four gospels. So we need to look at this. And I've heard this taught and preached from a lot of different angles, but I'm gonna give you a different perspective on this tonight. All right, so go to Mark, the sixth chapter, Mark, Mark six and 35. Mark six and 35, I'm, try, I'm gonna try not to read all of this. Mark six and 35. So now Mark 6 and Mark 6 and 36. Let's look at this. Mark 6 and 36. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. And this is the apostles talking to Jesus. Notice Jesus Christ's response. Now, God supplies all my needs. Now, watch what Jesus says, who is supposed to be handling the provision of people. Notice what he says here, verse 37. But G, but he answered, but he answered, they talking to Jesus. Jesus answered, you give them something to eat. <laughs> so Jesus said, you want them to go buy stuff. He said, you give them something to eat. Then he said, then, then said to him, um, they said to him, that would take more than half a year's wages. Are we to go? Listen to this. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them? And then Jesus said in verse 38, how many loaves do you have? He said, go and see. So, so, so the miracle of him feeding all these people, we said, oh, that's a miracle of Jesus feeding and multiplying. No, the miracle came because men refused to meet the need. Help me, Jesus. So oftentimes we are shouting in church about a provisional need that was in the church to be met. But because people were too selfish, God had to go be benevolent because we were not generous. That's crazy, y'all. So the need can be met because they, he, he says here, Peter is saying here, you know, man, that's going to take over a year's wages to go meet that. Are you crazy? Like, who, who's going to do that? And he asked him, notice what he says here. That would take more than a half year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread? And the answer that Jesus was saying was yes. So Jesus said, you know what? I ain't going to deal with it. How many loaves do y'all get? Because since you are not willing to go spend a half year's wages to go meet the needs of the people, then I'm going to have to perform a miracle because you are not sensitive enough to be benevolent. Now, y'all ready? I was saying all that to get y'all into this place. All right. Here we go. Now, right now, I'm busting up the myth 
I'm not being, I'm busting up the myth that God's supposed to supply every need. And I'm talking about in the church community. Now, I do believe, let me, let me balance this. I do believe that God does supply all our needs. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is when it comes to things that we have in our possession, and in our ability to be able to handle a need of a brother and sister in Christ, shame on us if we're looking to God to meet something that we can do in our own ability. That's the point I'm making. I do believe that God will supply all needs, but not above the ability and the capacity for us to meet the need. And shame on us if we're looking to God to do what he gave us the capacity to do. That's the point I'm making tonight. This is a huge part of the key of the uh, 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 of the uh, church culture. OK, I mean, of the church community. And I just showed you in the book of Acts. The book of Acts started out in benevolence. People gave. So let's stop right there because I'm going to get into the book of James here in a minute. Let's stop right there. Isn't it crazy that the book of Acts started out with people giving more, giving literally Everything that they literally laid down their life for their fellow brother and sister in Christ. And we struggle. We struggle with giving to people right now. And the New Testament church started out with us being generous givers. And we struggle. And I'm not just talking about finances because people here giving all they hear is money. I'm talking about your time, your insight, your resources. Why do we struggle with that when the, when the church was built on the foundation of generosity and giving? Jesus. All right, let's go to the book of James. I need to bust this myth up and then I'm going to let y'all go. I only got nine minutes. I'm going to get it out in nine. Here we go. The book of uh, James, the second chapter. I don't really want to read all of this. I want y'all to read. Here's your homework. Read James. When we get off tonight, off this line tonight, read James the entire first. I mean, read James the entire second chapter. Because I'm not going, I'm not going to get through all of this tonight. I'm going, I'm going to kind of skip down. I'm going to skip through some of this, all right? Because because for time's sake. So now James, the second chapter, verse, verse one. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Must not show favoritism. Now, of course, he's talking about favoritism here. Verse 2 says this. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes. And a poor man comes in in filthy clothes. In filthy, in filthy old clothes also comes in. Then, of course, it talks about if you show one special attention over the other one. It talks about those kind of things. Now, I'm going to jump down to verse 14 because time's sake, I won't get a chance to get to the thing I really want to talk about. Now. So when you get down to verse 14, it starts talking about how we should be benevolent towards people. And now verse 14 is picking up and now verse 14 is going to begin to break down what faith or our belief in God should look like modeled in helping people and being benevolent. That's really verse 15 all the way to verse 26 is talking specifically about how we are using that faith. And operating in that faith inside the context of a church community. So now look at verse 14 here. Uh, James, the second chapter, verse 14. I got eight minutes and I'm going to hit it hard. All right, here we go. Here we go. Verse 14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith, talking about they have a belief in God, they have a trust in God, what good is it to do that but has no deeds? So if I say I believe in God, but I'm not actually practically tangibly walking out my belief in God among the community around me. That's what that, that's what the writer James is saying here. Can such faith save them? So if you got a belief in God that doesn't allow you to be moved with empathy in the community around you, James is saying, can that kind of faith truly save you? Is that real salvation? I'm going somewhere here, y'all, tonight. Look at verse 15. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. Like what's happening right now with the coronavirus. Right? We have people who don't have food because they don't have jobs. People who are struggling to put clothes on their own children's back and on their back. Verse 16. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does, but does nothing about their physical needs 
What good is it? And y'all know y'all done been a part. Y'all done been a part. Some, I probably got pastors on here. I mean, you, you, you've been a part of a ministry. You go in, they say, we're going to pray for you. But they can, they financially can meet the need, realistically. But they just choose not to. They want to offer prayer as opposed to meeting the need. And James is saying here, what good is that? Verse 17. In the same way, faith. Now, it's talking about, it's talking about twofold here. It's talking about your belief in God, the faith you say you have in God, right? And, and the faith that we say we have. He says, in the same way, faith by itself is, I mean, faith by itself if it, if it is not accompanied by action, it's dead. So faith that I say I have, but, that, but the faith I have doesn't have an action that lines up with that faith, then what kind of salvation do you have? So if I'm saved, but my salvation doesn't lead me to be empathetic and help people when I can, or be there for people in my time, in my emotions, in my, in my, in my advice, and yes, in my finances, and literally giving the clothes off my back, James is saying here, if your faith is not accompanied by any action, your faith is dead. So you want to talk to me about faith without works is dead? Let's flip that tonight. If my faith is only speaking in tongues and praying to God, when I can meet the needs of not just my family, but people who are in need and I'm not doing it. He said, James is saying you have a dead religion. You have a dead faith. That your relationship with God is dead. Verse 18. I'm going to get off y'all in here in a minute. Y'all only got four more minutes of me. But someone will say, you have faith. I have deeds. Show me your faith without your deeds. And I will show you my faith by my actions. I, Paul, I mean, James is saying, I will show you that I have faith in God by what I do for other people. By how I'm able to be there for other people. Whether I'm praying for them, I'm consoling them, I'm comforting them, I, I, I'm loving on them, I'm there with them. I'm going to say something heavy. How I'm able to be there for the LGBT community even though I don't agree with their sin. Hello, not kicking my child out of Thanksgiving and not being able to come to Thanksgiving dinner because you're coming with your partner. Okay. See, that's a dead religion. That's a dead faith. Verse 19, you believe that there is, there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. So the fact that you believe that there is God, okay, what happened? He said, okay, the devil believe that. <laughs> what good is it believe? Okay, you believe God, so what? And verse 20, you foolish person. Now, I didn't call you a foolish person. I didn't even call you a fool. The Bible said that. You foolish person. Do you want evidence that faith without uh, without deeds is useless? And then it goes into talk about Abraham, which I won't do that. Now, jump down to verse 24. Jump down to verse 24. James, the second chapter, verse 24. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. Jesus Christ, help me. So I received Jesus and I got salvation in Jesus. But James is saying here that your salvation is tied up in your ability to consider other people. That you're not just righteous because you received Jesus. You're righteous by the actions that you do for people. So now I know somebody thinking, well, Ain't that working your faith? No, that's not working your faith. That's allowing your faith to do works. Uh, uh, God, here go the last scripture. I got two minutes. I did good, y'all. Somebody praying for your boy. I appreciate your prayers. James, the second chapter, 26 verse. Here we go, because we hear the scripture all the time. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without Deeds is dead. So when the Bible is talking there about faith without works is dead, it's not talking about work your faith the way that we teach it. It's literally saying that if you have a belief in God and if you have a faith in God, 
then that faith ought to move you to some physical action for your brother and sister. I'm going to take my glasses off. I'm going to take my glasses off and say this. So this means when you get a blessing that's too big for you, it don't mean take it and turn around and give it to your kids. It means be led by the spirit. To see who else God wants to use that blessing to be a blessing to. There are some blessings that God wants to give to you to get through you for someone else. And in this season, this is the prophetic word from God. In this season that we're in with the corona, God is going to put a lot of you who are still employed in a position financially, mentally, intellectually to be a benevolence to somebody else. And you, I'm telling you now. Hear the word of the Lord. You must allow God to use you to be a benefit to them. Because if you don't, your faith is dead. You're not saved for real. I'm trying to help y'all. But the Bible is teaching tonight is, is this. If you say you believe in God, there ought to be an action coming through you for somebody else. If you can do it, you ought to do it. Stop praying for people when you can meet the need. That's what the Bible is teaching us tonight. This is a church community concept. So the next time you say, God just supply all my needs. Before, do you not? And, and this is what God was showing me. When I and those are who just now joined, you're gonna to have to go back and listen to this, okay? Because I'm 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 out of here in in, in 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 literally one minute, okay? The miracle of the loaves of bread that Jesus did. Do you not know that Jesus was saying it's an indictment to you that I have to take care of the needs of people that I've given you? You gotta think about this. When Jesus met the apostles, they was broke. God had blessed them to a point when they had so much money they could travel with Jesus and take care of his needs. They were rich. They were so rich they had an accountant. Are you hearing me? So when they, so when Jesus said, feed the people, and then Peter and Philip was like, man, that's going to take almost a whole, like six months wages to take care of all these people. Jesus said, don't even worry about it. Where is the person with the, with the fish and the loaves of bread? Since I blessed you and you don't want to bless people, I now got to perform a miracle. <laughs> Man, that's crazy. So the, so the miracle of the fish and the loaves, we always have heard talk, God broke bread and God fed 5,000 or 4,000. We shout about that. But that's actually an indictment to the, to, to the apostles. Because he asked them, you give them meat. Which means Jesus would have never asked them to give them meat if God was going to supply the need. He was saying that to them to push them to operate in their faith and say, hey, listen, you got enough money right now to meet the need. They said, man, we're supposed to take six months wait, which means they had more than six months worth of money stored up and saved up to meet the need. They had the money to meet the need. So the apostles learned this lesson because when Acts 2 and when Acts the second chapter and the fourth chapter comes into existence, they now say, hey, we need to raise up people to take care of this. This was such a, I mean, they had, they were so rebuked by this that as they begin to build the church, everybody began to bring stuff to the apostles and the apostles began to distribute out of the benevolence that was given. Which means they learn from the rebuke of the miracle. So what we call a re, uh, the miracle really is a really is a divine rebuke. <laughs> the apostles so learned this that they said, you know what? We gonna now distribute, and so people begin to bring their possessions to the apostles, and the apostles begin to distribute out of what people gave into the body of believers so that nobody had lack of anything. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So I'm going to conclude. My time is all gone. Those of you who are just now joined, I thank you. God bless you. Go back and listen to the first 39 minutes or whatever it is. I'm done for the night. 
This is your boy. You know how we do. We're going to keep talking and keep, we're going to keep spitting it straight, straight at you. I'll continue to tune in. I'm going to be back here tomorrow at six o'clock right then telling you the same thing I've been telling you. And we're going to continue to speak truth to you. All right. This is Apostle Moses. I'm signing off for tonight. I am done. Take care. God bless you. We'll see you in the same place, the same time tomorrow at six o'clock. Speaking truth to you from the word of God.